Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I am Chris Mikowski, and I'm pleased to have joining me today my friend and colleague, Paul Ashdown. Paul, how are you today? Doing well, Chris. I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and it's good to see you as always. Likewise, likewise. So this is actually going to be the first of two conversations that Paul and I are going to have this week. We're going to spend some time talking about his new book, Imagining Wild Bill, Get a little cover glare there. Uh, it's about Wild Bill Hickok in myth and memory as well as history. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history part tonight. And then later this week, uh, Paul's co-author Ed Cottle will join us and we'll talk um, in more depth about sort of the memory of Wild Bill. But uh, Paul, why Wild Bill in the first place? Yeah, you know, he's an interesting character. Uh, he comes out of the Civil War, uh, rather obscure figure. And then, of course, he becomes one of the many legendary uh, gunfighters uh, of the Wild West era. But, uh, you know, I was reading your friend uh, uh, Daniel Davis, this, this wonderful book uh, that he sent me, The Most Desperate Acts of Gallantry, George A. Custer in the Civil War. And now, if we did Wild Bill Hickok, in the Civil War, it'd be a very short book. In fact, it'd probably be about a chapter. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the intriguing part of this. This is one of these figures, and there's so many of them who come out of the Civil War era, and they're not well documented. So what happens is this big carapace of myth builds up around them. And that's certainly the case with Wild Bill. He starts out in uh, Illinois, born in 1837, uh, about 70 miles from the outskirts of what's now Chicago. And his family, uh, they were abolitionists. And so they were on the Underground Railroad. And uh, Wild Bill, he wasn't called Wild Bill in those days, we'll just call him Wild Bill for simplification. Uh, he and his father uh, particularly were involved in helping uh, slaves from primarily southern Illinois and Missouri get into uh, uh, free territories. And Illinois was a very divided state. Southern part of Illinois was uh, tended to be uh, identified more with the slave uh, states. And uh, so there was a lot of activity on this, uh, on this line. And so I think we could, first thing we could say about uh, James Butler Hickok was he was firmly a union man. And that, uh, I think, is kind of central to what happened later on. Then, like many people, he lit out for the territories. And in his case, he went with his brother to Kansas. And we think this was about 1855. And there he uh, was a young man who was trying to find his identity. He did some farming. He was a laborer. And then in uh, 1858, he was selected one of four constables to a small town called Monticello, Kansas. This is now part of Kansas City, greater Kansas City. Actually, Monticello doesn't exist anymore. And what we know about him is that uh, he certainly was involved in the troubles in Kansas and Missouri in the 1850s. We just don't know much about it. He probably served in the Free State Army, and there's some evidence that he had uh, some cabins that were burned out by uh, the pro-slavery uh, forces. But as to what he did, there's a lot of stories being told, but uh, we don't have a lot of hard information. He just sort of was there, was present, uh, was certainly involved in some of the uh, altercations that occurred, and that's about as much as we know. Why is it that, that so much of his background like that seems to be so poorly documented? Why, why, why isn't there a wealth of letters or diaries or records? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, because um, in the big scheme of things, he was, uh, he was a, a mule skinner. He was a driver. He was a wagon driver. Um, and he, he never formally enlisted in the Army. He, he served with the Army. We can't find any evidence that he actually ever formally enlisted, although we know he was in uh, and connected with the Union forces. So when you're low down in the totem pole, where's the documentation? Very, very few, a few scattered uh, references, uh, letters. There's uh, a few documents that indicate he was paid for certain things. We've got his name on some payroll documents. <clears throat> 
That's about it. And so, of course, in the absence of hard information, you get a lot of soft information that builds up. Now, this, of course, is very new to us because we've been studying Sherman and Custer and Nathan Bedford Forrest and John Singleton Mosby. We got a lot of information about them. We know who they were. A lot of people wrote about them, a lot of documents. But here we don't have very much to work with. That in itself is a bit of a challenge. So, and, and when you say we, you're talking about you and your co-author, Ed, and, and you have yeah. a series of books where you talk about Civil War figures who then went on to make names for themselves in, a, in an important way after the war, associated with, uh, in many cases, the Old West. So these figures of, of Civil War history who then grow into legend and myth and memory, as you guys talk about. And so while, yeah. while Bill is kind of the latest in that series... Yeah, and I think uh, I've always been curious about this, um, and I know you are too, about what happens after the war. You know, we had, tend to focus on a disruptive event like the Civil War, but many of the people that came out of that war lived a long time. I grew up at just after the end of World War II, and I, my whole life has been dominated by the memory of that war. The last veterans are just dying off now, and you grow up uh, in the shadow of this terrible event. And you hear stories. You hear stories about people that were participants. You hear stories from people that knew some of the participants who, um, who had, had, had died. You have family members. And it, it just seems to me that the, the aftermath of the Civil War is as fascinating as what happened during the war. And I don't mean just the formal Reconstruction era. I mean, how it gets into the next century. And see, I was born in 1944, so if I had been born in 1844, that means I would now be alive in 1920. I still got a few years to go, so I mean, I have a pretty keen memory of the 1960s. You know, talk your ear off about the 1960s. So there must have been all sorts yeah, of codgers. I've, I've always been told that if you can remember the 1960s, you didn't really live. You weren't there, there right. Well, I didn't say the stories were accurate. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that also relates to this because I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of BS about the Civil War, and undoubtedly in multiple tellings, this uh, this began to expand, and particularly true in the case of Wild Bill, because the key thing here is he's a vet, he's a veteran. Well, regardless of whether he was formally in the military, he was a wagon driver, he was a scout, he was a spy, he was involved in several battles, so he comes out of it with a memory of the war. And he, uh, he's, in, he's in contact with people that were in the war. These people, um, Bill, um, while Bill dies in 1876, so I think we can say most of his contemporaries were probably affected by the war in some way. So that's a long answer to your question. That's why I was interested in this, uh, to tr try to take the story forward and see, see what happens when it gets into the next generation. And of course, his wartime service and his pre-wartime service, you know, nobody knows that he's eventually going to be one of the most famous characters in America, you know, years down the road. So I can see why there wouldn't necessarily be a lot of documentary evidence and, and record keeping, all that stuff. So he, he becomes famous. That's a still a, a pretty meteoric rise from obscurity to fame. Um, is that indicative of, of other people during that time or is, is his story pretty unique that way? Yeah. I think what it's indicative of is the whole concept of celebrity, which on our own time is, uh, is such an important concept. I mean, we recognize celebrity, we think about celebrity in a way that people in the previous century probably didn't think. Uh, this, so Hickok is a media sensation. And what interested us as uh, journalists, former journalists and media historians, was what the press was doing. Well, the press, of course, recognizes a good story. Now here you've got a guy who's a good story. And if the story is not exactly true, well, we don't worry about that because this is gonna get readers. And I think that's the key to it is uh, he becomes a, a figure, uh, an important figure because the, the press, the media, the dime novel writers, and later uh, <clears throat> movie uh, writers, movie producers, uh, television producers, uh, pulp magazines, they see something in Hickok that uh, interests the public. And then, of course, if the public didn't care, 
you know, if you write about this character and nobody, nobody cares, well, he just disappears. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why are people interested in it? What is it about him? It's interesting. Well, let's go back to the, let's go back to the war. What did he do in the war? Well, we know that he was a scout. Now, what better thing to be in the civil war than a scout? I mean, first of all, nobody knows what you're doing. You know, you're, this was uh, John Singleton Mosby. You're moving around at night. You're reporting back to the uh, commanding officer with secret plans and documents. You're kind of a secret agent type. Great. Now, how are you going to document that? Where are the battle reports? Well, they, you know, they're hard to find. And the other thing is that he is a, um, um, he's kind of a military policeman for part of his service, meaning that what he does is he uh, chases down deserters. Imagine the amount of stolen goods from a military base at this time period. So somebody, uh, you know, walks off with a cannon or something like this. They send Wild Bill out to track the guy down and bring government property back. So uh, he also does a bunch of spying. Uh, he's not just a scout, so that there are stories about him, not very well documented, but we, we have stories about uh, Hickok, who apparently infiltrated Confederate lines in Arkansas and somehow gets a uniform on, a Confederate uniform, and he's, he's behind the lines for several months and uh, he, he gets onto the staff of some of the, uh, some of the Confederate generals, and he's feeding him bad information. It's fantastic stuff. Again, hard to document. Now, uh, Hickok is interesting because uh, reports of him are very uh, contradictory. And he seems to be a very modest guy. Um, he, there's not much evidence that he went around bragging about his uh, wartime uh, activities, which to me makes him even more interesting. He seems to be one of those characters, and I've met a few in my lifetime, you maybe have as well, where people project on them all sorts of things. Uh, this is your, your, your football hero, or, or someone who has uh, uh, supposedly uh, been involved in all sorts of fantastic uh, adventures. And people approach these people and they want autographs. They want them to tell about their experiences. And the subject of this is suitably modest, who just says, yeah, yeah, but people say that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so all of a sudden, you know, he, he's confirming it, the stories about him simply by not denying them. And because he's a Western character, he seemed to have, have had a gift for, um, you know, invention, telling the, in the American uh, tall tale tradition. He was a good raconteur. He was also a great poker player, interestingly, and of course a good, poker player is kind of a stone face. So uh, Wild Bill seemed to know how to, how to work, work the table and work the crowd when he wanted to. He also spent some time after the war in a circus. Uh, he was also on stage for a while, um, you know, performing the Wild West acts like in, in, the, uh, in the Wild West shows. So, you know, he had a, he had a flair for getting attention. That's about the best we can say about him. And he was involved in some significant battles too. We tend to forget about these. You all in Virginia keep bringing up Fredericksburg and <laughs> Chancellorsville and these other little skirmishes. But out west, you know, they had the Battle of Wilson's Creek, which was huge in Missouri, and he was definitely in that. He was in the Battle of Pea Ridge, which was a major battle in the west. And one of the Confederate generals in that battle, Ben McCulloch, was shot and killed killed. Stories got around that it was Hickok that shot him from a tremendous distance. I mean, an incredible distance because he was a sharpshooter. And then he was also involved to some extent in uh, the Battle of Westport. That's really the Battle of Kansas City toward the end of the war. And that's called the Gettysburg of the West. And we know he was there and he was involved in it in some way as a scout, probably participated in it. And then the last thing we hear about Wild Bill, and this is great, Somebody records that at the end of the war, um, a rider rides alongside a train. This is out in uh, Missouri. And the rider yells so everybody can hear him on the train, Robert E. Lee just surrendered. It turns out that was Wild Bill <laughs> announcing so, the end of the war. <clears throat> even though we don't have a whole lot of hard evidence, boy, we've got a lot of great stories. You stories, can stories, yeah. Go with the stories. Yeah.
Wow, that's a, a skeleton of a, of a framework of a, of a fantastic story right there. So, and you know, and, and as you say, as a, a scout, as a spy, that's clandestine, so it's romantic and not documented and top secret and dangerous. Um, wow, all the elements to create um, a great action hero. Yeah. And at the end of the war, uh, Army serving lieutenant colonel named George uh, Ward Nichols um, goes to uh, Springfield, Missouri, and he meets Wild Bill. And Ward uh, Nichols has a uh, background in journalism. Before the war, he was uh, uh, worked for some Eastern newspapers, primarily as a music and art critic. But he served uh, with Sherman during Sherman's March, he was on Sherman's staff and wrote a pretty good history of Sherman's March and was also a novelist. And when he met Wild Bill in Springfield, uh, he was the, Bill was well known to uh, the uh, Army Post people. And so uh, Nichols had picked up a bunch of stories about Hickok. And uh, he writes this fantastic article about him, which gets published in Harper's about two years later. It took a long time to get into print. And it's, it recounts and quotes uh, Hickok uh, as, as uh, explaining all these Civil War adventures, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, he had a, a horse, for example, that supposedly was trained to come into a saloon and get up on a table and stuff like this. And Nichols, who seemed to be nobody's fool, was just taking all this down. And when the story uh, appeared in print, wildly embellished, uh, and then was published and began to circulate in the West, caused a sensation. A lot of newspaper editors said, is this the same guy? Is this James Butler Hickok? This, this guy, we know him. Did he do all this stuff? I never heard anything about it. And this, uh, uh, this would be like getting a, uh, an article published in uh, Life or Time magazine in the 1960s. I mean, it was well read. And this is basically the invention of, of Hickok at that point, because from that point on, these dime novelists get hold of him and begin inventing stories about his, uh, his, his career, particularly in the, in the military. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually suggest that we hold off on that for part two of the conversation. We'll get Ed yeah, in. We, so we'll we, tantalize we'll people with this, this creation. We, and I want to go back to something you said. You mentioned his full name, James Butler Hickok. So there's no Bill in there at all. No. So somehow he turns into Wild Bill. And so in part two of our conversation, we're going to talk about that transformation and how he springboards uh, into this character that we now know. So now, uh, Paul, you're, you're modest. So I want to back up to something earlier in the conversation where you held up Dan Davis's book about George Custer and the Civil War. You actually wrote a fantastic appendix for that that talks about Custer in memory and how and why we remember Custer as we do. So I want to point people to some of your work uh, that, that you've done here for the Emerging Civil War. So. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh writing that because uh, it's a fair question. And I think all of us that are interested in history probably get asked this question, you need to think about it is, how do we get into this? What is it? What's the draw? What's the pull? And the usual answer to that is, well, you know, grandma gave me a book when I was 10 years old and all of this stuff, or my, my family, uh, you know, took me to Gettysburg and from then on I was hooked and so forth. And uh, I, this was probably, um, it's probably still true of lots of kids it may have been more true at a particular point in time when the memory of the war was uh, so vivid. And also, you, you of course, uh, recall that the, uh, in the 1960s, we had these centennial commissions that were uh, going back to the 100th anniversary of the war. So this was all over. I mean, this was in school curricula, everybody talking about the Civil War. So yes, of course, the interest just builds up. And that's what I was trying to uh, write about in that essay you mentioned about Custer and memory is, is how, does, how does a memory uh, get carried on and what happens to that memory as it becomes sort of laundered, you know, th through all these uh, different sorts of media that um, begin to develop it. It's not so much that the media uh, are making up a false narrative as that the public has some need of something in the narrative 
that feeds the demand for it. And right now, a question I suppose you get in your emerging Civil War discussions, right now there seems to be something of a dearth of uh, interest in the Civil War on television, for example, but there were times when you could, you could every channel had some kind of Civil War related kind of program. Does that mean that interest in the Civil War is less now, or does it mean that the narrative has been reshaped for another generation? Or are we in the middle of uh, trying to sort that out? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk more about that um, when we talk about some of your other books later in this conversation, too, because mm -hmm. I think the work that you and Ed have done kind of tracking that with different Civil War characters has been fascinating stuff. And, uh, you know, I highly encourage folks to read. <laughs> so the book we're talking about today, Imagining Wild Bill, part of the Engaging the Civil War series with uh, Southern Illinois University Press. Um, Paul, I'm looking forward to part two of this conversation. But as always, um, so fun to sit down and talk with you. Thank you so much today. Same. Thank you very much, Chris. Wonderful. Bye now. Thank you very much for joining us. On behalf of Paul, I'm Chris Mikowski. We will see you online and on the battlefield.